So the incident rate gives us a picture of the um, rate at which events, the frequency at which events, like these events are happening in our population over a period of time. So in this particular table, I'm using 14 days and seven days. And I really started breaking it down by seven days more recently because that's how quickly our trends were evolving. Um, so high transmission is greater or equal to 100 new cases per day per 100,000 um, people in the past seven days or um, greater than or equal to 10% of tests positive in the past seven days. And quite recently, we were at that point, both in Northampton and the state, and we've since sharply trended downward. And now we are really in that moderate zone of um, 10 to 49 or 0.99 new cases per day per 100,000 with, um, and our test positivity rate as a state is actually down to 3%. So the state is trending towards that low transmission risk. And I, I anticipate we'll be there um, soon here maybe in less than a week, but it's hard to predict with COVID as we know. Does that clear that up? Um, Vivian, one quick question. On the Cooley Dickinson capacity, I just wanna make sure I'm reading it right. Um, so for example, on 8-1-21, they, they were filled with 79%, 79% of their beds were filled and 91% of their ICU beds were filled. Is that correct? That, yes. Yeah, so that's total hospital capacity first and then ICU capacity second. And um, then, so, oh, sorry, if we wanted to know the number of COVID cases in the hospital, we really don't have that on this chart. Down below that, we have a seven day history of total sum of admissions. What it doesn't give you is on average how many, um, how many inpatients they had with COVID per day, which if you go to the source of that data, um, okay. that used, you can access that. Um, okay. So this is seven day sum of hospital admissions, COVID-19 patients, and then seven day um, sum of ER visits. <clears throat> that date, what was it on that date? Okay, okay, thank you. And Dr. Levin, I, I didn't have data, um, public data for today or the 15th. So I, I mm -hmm. didn't have that data. So I'm not sure if the hospital's sharing that yet or. I don't know this metric about admissions or ER visits, but I generally track how many people are hospitalized mm -hmm. uh, who have COVID. Most of them are hospitalized for COVID, not just incidental COVID. Um, and uh, I don't, I didn't share the graph with you today, but at our peak during this wave, our peak was something like, uh, I think it was 26 um, patients in the hospital in any one day with COVID. Um, and I believe this morning it was six. Yeah. So everything's trending downward. You can see that with our transmission statistics and our hospital statistics. So I'll just add though that, um, even though um, the hospital does share its um, capacity, we have a very full hospital, but it is not full with COVID. Um, so it's a little distracting to, to see those numbers because our, our hospital is very, very busy, um, but it's not necessarily due to COVID. And you can definitely see that when we were really calm back in May through August, the hospital was still you know, pretty filled. Um, but really, no, like COVID admissions at that time, or very few COVID admissions at that time. So I think that shows that. Um, okay, so this is a close up of the surge that we are finally, hopefully, getting out of. Um, I think I said to Dr. Levin yet the other day, I said, we're almost out of the woods, but and the trees are shorter. <laughs> um, we can kind of see the sky at this point. Um, so at our, really towards our peak, which was really the first week of January, which makes sense, it was directly after um, both, you know, the holidays and New Year's, um, we had 525 cases in the span of seven days with an incident rate of 257 cases per 100,000 people. And Massachusetts at that time had a test positivity rate of a whopping 23%. 
in contrast to now, really just a month later, that's how quickly this whole situation has evolved. We had 93 cases in the span of seven days. Um, there's a little bit of a reporting delay. I really like to wait for um, tests to come in. So for example, tests are still rolling into us from the, the 15th and the 16th still. Um, so 93 cases in the span of seven days, which is pretty similar to the week uh, prior to that, you'll notice. Um, so it could be that we're trending down and then plateauing, but it's really soon too soon to tell. Um, with an incident rate of 45 cases per day per 100,000 people. And the test positivity rate in Massachusetts overall has still continued on a downward trend. So overall really looking great. And Vivian, just to clarify, these are case counts for Northampton, not for yes. Hampshire County. Yes, this is mm -hmm. just Northampton. This is not Hampshire County. Because when we look at Hampshire County rates, they look like they're going the other way. Briefly. Yeah, briefly. In the New York Times graphic, uh, Hampshire County is the only red county in Massachusetts. I wonder well, what metrics they're using. The only, the only one. Right, and that there was a spike in Amherst between uh, February seventh and tenth, primarily mm -hmm. made up of eighteen to twenty-two year olds. So mm. we're that thinking that UMass skewed yeah. our data and put us back in the red. Yep, and I looked at UMass's COVID dashboard for that time period and they were spiking up. So I'm honestly not sure what caused that spike and UMass is in its own right, its own community. Um, so- Shenanigans. What? Shenanigans caused it. <laughs> Shenanigans caused it, yeah. So overall, we're still trending downward. I know I got a lot of um, concerned community phone calls about this some spike and I guess they must have been looking at the New York Times because on a CDC county tracker, the, whole, the entire state of Massachusetts is still red. But um, so I wonder what metrics, again, I wonder what metrics they're using, but I, I would say we're, even if we're still red, we're trending out of the red. Yeah, and definitely yeah. in Northampton, we are down the yellow. Okay. Has there been Thank any you. discussion on the state level about the value of continuing to count cases when there are so many home tests being done? And I imagine that many of them are not, most of them are not getting PCRs. I think it's a mixed bag. Um, and I think that with the tests that we have reported to us, we're still collecting valuable information in terms of overall trends. And then, um, this, what's happening more and more that the state's been talking about is community wastewater um, analysis, which we do not do in this community, but um, like Boston has wastewater. I think correct, some correctional facilities have wastewater analysis. Um, and it's very interesting. And sometimes those trends even predict our testing trends. Um, we used to test it. Uh, we tested it very early on, uh, probably six months into COVID. We were testing our wa wastewater. It was very expensive, and there was a couple of variables. We, we tested at our treatment plant, um, but we also have Williamsburg coming into our treatment plant, and we have the hospital coming into our treatment plant to plant. So the data was a little skewed, but it was definitely interesting to look at the trends. It could kind of predict two weeks out what we might see per cases per 100,000, which I I mean, it was, I'm not saying it was spot on, but it was, it was neat to look at. But we also, just to let you know, Suzanne, we had used um, wastewater and testing for opiates years prior to. So we were kind of progressive in and using wastewater, um, and it was fascinating, the data we could pull from there. That's why I tell people, do not flush the rest of your pills down the toilet. <laughs> right? <laughs> Crush them up in something wet and put them in your trash. Yep. <laughs> so Meredith um, or Vivian, do you know if there's any plan uh, moving forward for the state to support wastewater um, testing going forward? Because there's really no other metric that we can rely on. Obviously, people are doing home tests uh, more than about it. PCRs. And the other thing is that uh, I, you know, I used to think hospital data would be a good way to go, but now we have oral treatments, and we're trying to prevent people from getting into the hospital, even with COVID. 
um, or severe, you know, prevent severe COVID so that hopefully our hospital numbers will not reflect um, community transmission as closely as it does now. Um, so I, I think going forward, uh, wastewater monitoring would be the way to go. So they are talking about it on the state level, and um, I'm hoping that it will get funded somehow once again. Uh, oh, it was BioBot. That's who used to do the testing was BioBot. So there is conversations happening using that, um, that data. Hospital data is tricky because by the time we see hospital data trending up, that usually means we're three to four weeks into, um, you know, a surge again. So we can't solely rely on that. It'll be interesting to see what happens, how we move forward with testing on the state. I know the state contract for the Stop the Spread sites is up at the end of March. I'm hoping, I'm assuming it'll get renewed and we continue with surveillance testing. But again, everything is just kind of wait and see right now. Okay. Good. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So um, Viv Vivian, can you tell me the difference between case count and incident rate? Yep. So case counts just your raw data. How many cases did we get right reported yep. in that time period? And that's cases that were that tested positive in that time period. Um, the incident rate is that is a very valuable calculation. It tells us. Um, your risk for a disease. It tells us how frequently um, infection is happening in a population for a period of time. Um, and it's helpful to do it per 100,000 because it, I mean, it helps you just compare different populations that have different population, you know, different numbers in the population. Um, <laughs> so that's just telling us, you know, 525 people um, is a lot in Northampton, but your incident rate helps you out and that. 525 people is a lot in Northampton, but imagine that number, say, in Hatfield. Your incident rate would be way up there. Um, so that, that incident rate help both helps inform the risk of transmission, but also um, helps you compare populations. And Vivian, the incident rate is per 100,000 per day, correct? Yeah, so it's per, it's your average cases that occur per day per 100,000 people over a period of time. So I calculate for my seven day incident and I just realized that incident rate I have right here, that's a seven day incident rate because the date ranges that I presented were seven days and I, I should have put that on top. I was very tired when I made this graph. Um, but um, yeah, so that's the unit is average cases per day per 100,000 people. So you go from one to the other because it's per day, you divide your 93 by seven, and because it's per 100,000, you have to correct by the population of Northampton. So it, you multiply by three roughly, right? So, uh, yeah, so my, the, the calculation, one of these days, I'll have to remember to write this out for you, Laurent, <laughs> um, so I can share it with you, but um, it's just a little bit of algebra where you have your, um, your average, your average, your daily average, so just your raw daily average, 525 divided by seven, whatever that is. And I don't really remember that off the top of my head. You have that over your population of Northampton. That's your average cases per day per Northampton population. But to get your per 100,000 population, you need to cross multiply it by, you know, X over 100,000 people. So you have to do a little mathematics. Thank you. Is Laurent doing the math over there? <laughs> <laughs> Checking your math. All right, let's no. move forward. Okay, so we, yeah. So I just wanted to share what um, CDC has for us. And you'll see they have the whole state of Massachusetts as of February 15th, still very much in the red, very cozy in the red, um, but really all trends point downward. That's our percent positivity, um, our daily cases, um, deaths always lag behind cases. So daily deaths are still on a kind of upward trend, but they're kind of looks like they're sort of spiking down on the very, very right there. Um, hospitalizations are going way down. Um, and what I found interesting too about this was it shows since the beginning of the pandemic, it shows our percent positivity and our daily tests performed 
And you'll see that our daily tests performed really kind of stays around the same so September through January and you still get that huge spike there. So I don't think it was an issue of more or less tests were performed at any one point, except for in the summer when we were living our best lives. But I don't know, I wanted to share this because you, you know, you see one thing when you just look at that map, but you, if you look more closely at the data, you really see that it's following that same trajectory that we're seeing here in mass um, with our data. And I haven't looked at this, but the um, CDC and the New York Times may be using different cut points. I think so. I think they're using different metrics. And again, this is county, a uh, CDC does county level data. Mm -hmm. So with uh, um, UMass outbreaks, it skews the whole county. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> uh, and then this is Massachusetts. This is the whole state. So it's the whole state, just like us, really trending downward. Um, our test positivity today, 2.9%. So just about 3%. Our seven day average of hospitalizations going down and uh, Massachusetts also has our deaths going down. So I think that that wasn't really captured with that whole view since the whole beginning of the pandemic um, that the CDC has. So really just comparing with um, the data for Northampton, we're all kind of on the same boat, so to speak. Any other questions for Vivian? Oh, you have one more, one or two more. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and I know that we wanted to talk about um, the mask mandate in the context of how it will affect our school population. So we did want to look at um, our vaccination coverage for all of our grades. So this is all of the grades in Northampton public schools. I do not have vaccination data for um, other school systems like Smith Folk. Um, but it's all the grade levels and split up by our elementary school programs as well, um, just to add some context. And I will say, um, so 90% of grades six through 12 have at least one dose. A lot of those kiddos do have their booster now as well. Um, and the 80% of grades kindergarten through fifth grade in total over all four of the elementary schools have at least one dose. time I see this data, I'm just astounded um, by the participation um, by the students. It's really remarkable. Um, I don't think that's true in a lot of other places. So um, kudos to them and to their parents. <laughs> so is Bridge Street less than the other for a data reason or really because Bridge Street stands out? So we are, I don't know, Meredith, if, I, if I'm privy to share that, but we, we want to um, find out really meaningful res, like data on different reasons for you know, lower um, vaccine uptake in our population. Um, oh, yeah. It's hard, it's hard to just look at data and be able to tell you why Bridge Street has, you know, a couple of percentages less um, in vaccine coverage without really going to the source, you know. Of course, no, no, I'm not yeah. suggesting, and I'm. Um, you know, we have really just found this to, uh, make the vaccine as accessible as possible. Um, we have Kate Kelly, who's just a vaccine warrior, and will, you know, pull up to a person's house and just look at the vaccine or. <laughs> drive all over all over the city of Northampton, Hampshire County and give people vaccines. So we've, you know, really, you know, worked hard to make it as accessible as possible. But um, there's a lot of factors that go into why, you know, why people are not getting the vaccine. And I don't think it's as simple as, you know, saying like they're anti-vaxxers or something. I think there's there's a lot of nuance to the reason for that. Yeah. I think uh, Lauren's question might have been just, are you sure we have all the data? Is everybody oh, reporting? I, yeah, I mean, you're, anytime you look at data, that's, I mean, this is raw data, right? Um, so it's raw data, it uses MIAS, that just like we use for our city data. Um, and, and then the, that data um, is accessible through the school nursing portal. 
um, because they use that to track, you know, other routine vaccines. So, I mean, it's subject to error, just like um, our data would be, but I don't know that it would miss huge amounts of data, especially when you're talking about just students with one plus dose. Odds are that one of their doses, you know, is reported correctly. No, it's an, it's interesting. I just um, because it's it seems that it's consistent enough that there's something that's happening. Well, uh, again, I, the I cause. Can also, mm-hmm. I can also add that um, out of all of these schools, at Bridge Street, we didn't go and give vaccines at the school. Mm. I believe we were at every other school besides Bridge Street because it's a parking nightmare. But we were in the area at the lumber yard and. Mm-hmm. Um, made sure that we got notification to the Bridge Street parents. So that might be a factor in it. Not really sure um, what percent that would play into, but we did make note of this when we looked at this data the other day. Mm -hmm. So at the SHAC meeting, we discussed about, you know, um, doing a survey to figure out why it is. Um, You're not, you know, uh, the students aren't getting vaxxed and listing, a bunch of different reasons, you know, my child is afraid of needles, my child had COVID, so they don't need the vaccine and just listing them, see if we can get some information back to help drive our work going forward. I'm not sure how successful um, it'll be doing a survey like this, but we're going to try anyways. So we're thinking about those things also, Lauren. If, if you were to look at the mandated vaccines, setting aside COVID for a, a while and then focus on say uh, uh, measles, mm-hmm. do we have a similar trend? I mean, that might be a first thing, which is that, that would answer this. Is this cultural or is this logistical? I we think have- we don't have a lot of data. I think we've looked at that data before and there are a lot of holes in that data and there's reporting issues because it's up to the school nurses to report that and they don't get into, I don't know if they get into MIS as reliably or or the schools don't report them. Schools don't report them as reliably as a, as a school. Right. Yeah. And additionally, parents might slow the vaccine schedule down. So if we're capturing it at kindergarten, but they chose to do it a later date, it, then it doesn't get in the data set. So it looks like that we might have a higher um, un or under vaccination, childhood vaccination rate in our schools. That's, yeah, that's not perfect. I think that's something that we've talked about for years, Dr. Levin, about you know trying to capture that data better, um, mm-hmm. maybe after COVID. We can we can work on that. Well, so there's a, a there's a bill um, at the state level called the Community Immunity Bill that uh, Joe Comerford is working on um, that we talked about just before COVID. We were talking about uh, vaccinations like this, and in that bill is a better system for keeping track of vaccinations um, and for any exemptions going through, not going through the school nurse, but going through departments of health or other other more formal routes um, and keeping better track of things. So um, there is a move afoot to uh, improve that kind of reporting. Right, because not a lot of, I mean, many, many practices really never used MIS before, even though it's required if you're giving childhood vaccines, um, so. This might, COVID might move the needle on that also. Just, I just want to make sure I understand one plus versus plus one. Is this data including students who have only had one dose? Correct. So this is students with one or more dose. So we don't have, which we've seen in other um, um, age categories throughout the country, state, those who have received two, those primary series, and those who have been boosted. We don't have that kind of data. Not for the schools, no. Okay, thank you. Not that they can't get it, it's just very time consuming. Correct, Vivian? Yes, yes. It's not like, so they only have extremely raw data. They don't like this. The data that I present when I present the population vaccine data, it's already broken down for me. Um, it's 
it's very easy for me to pick apart and make into pretty graphs for you. But um, the data they have is just raw data. It would be it would be very time consuming to you know figure out who had um, one dose, who had two doses, who had the booster. So we it's it's a bit of a leap to say that the the twelfth graders have, are ninety four percent vaccinated. Not that big of a leap, but you know, most most people who get one dose are going to get the second dose. And actually, a lot of our okay, um, twelve to fifteen year olds have also gotten the booster at this point. Right. So if you look at the state vaccination data, which breaks it down by demographics and overlay it, it'll yep. look pretty similar if you look at the second dose and the booster. Okay. Um, yeah. So you probably can come up with a factor that a 94% rate tells you the percentage of the, the actually boosted people, knowing the statistics yeah. of Massachusetts. Like, I don't know, three quarters of the vaccinated people will eventually get a booster. Or two third, I don't know. This is a really interesting data set though. This gives a lot of ideas. What was happening? We still have a lot of work to do. I, yes, the the rates are great, um, but there's still work to be done. I'm still baffled. I have to say, to have such a high twelfth grade vaccination rate, and then when you look at age category and you include the nineteen and twenty years old, you your vaccination rate is plummeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Parental influence. <laughs> Vivian, do you have one more? I can't remember. I have a couple. Oh, there's, oh. There's more. Um, I just wanted to share sort of a recent data that's out there in the world. This is um, from January 28th, uh, CDC data, looking at um, hospitalizations in California. Um, and the solid blue line that looks like a mountain uh, are unvaccinated folks. Um, and you can see that's the Delta wave that was Ju July, August, September, and then another little bump in October. Um, and um, there are a bunch of dotted lines down near the bottom. Um, so people had a very low hospitalization rate and those were not only vaccinated with no previous COVID, but also um, unvaccinated folks who had a previ previous COVID diagnosis. So this brings up the point that um, people with a previous COVID diagnosis are protected, at least during Delta, they were protected uh, um, from uh, hospitalization. So this is really, really interesting data. Um, and we don't have the data, I think, for this for Omicron. Um, and um, also today, there were two articles in the New England Journal that just came out today. Now, so this is data for hospitalization. Um, there was data about um, infection, meaning just having a positive test. And they looked at people who, were, um, who had a previous diagnosis of COVID and those who had um, vaccine. And they did find that having both a previous diagnosis, um, no, let's see, that having vaccine in addition to a previous diagnosis was more protective than having a previous diagnosis alone. Um, so that again, adds more information that, you know, there's a lot of people who have had COVID, particularly in Omicron, are saying, well, do I really need a vaccine now? Um, but again, that data that I just quoted um, comes from Israel and it comes during from the Delta era. It's not during the Omicron era. So we don't really know about that. Um, it is still recommended that people get their vaccination or a booster, even if they've had COVID, because we know it's more reliable. Um, predictable um, immunization um, and protection, um, but this is still really interesting data. Unfortunately, we don't have a clinical test to measure, like if someone had COVID and they haven't had their vaccine, it's like, well, am I, am I, am I protected or am I not? We do not have that clinical test. Um, and that's something that we, we need. That would be great to have. I think I have a couple of other slides we that do. could you advance? Great, this is a, a report out of the CDC from a couple of weeks ago. Um, they looked at um, people who got COVID and people who didn't get COVID and had a questionnaire about, you know, do you sometimes always never wear a mask? 
Um, and the cloth mask, even though it says 56% lower odds, it wasn't really statistically significant. Um, but people who wore a surgical mask or a, a high grade respirator like a N95 or KN95 were significantly protected. So we do know that masks work, at least good quality masks um, are protective. And I, did I have one more? Oh yeah, this is yet another article looking at people with naturally acquired immunity uh, with and without uh, another vaccine. And um, the, the uh, unvaccinated is in red and at the top of the graph is one, which is means they, are pre they have freedom from reinfection, meaning they didn't get an infection. Um, and then over time, the unvaccinated group uh, got infected um, as compared with the group who also had acquired immunity as well as um, a, um, a vaccine. So this is a, yet another study that says that um, adding one Pfizer vaccine decreased the risk of re reinfection and symptomatic infection by 82%. Um, so it seems like you can sort of think of it as having a, an episode of COVID is maybe equivalent to one vaccine, not great coverage and adding another vaccine gives you better protection. Um, I think that's all I had. And Joanne, Joanne, I asked this last week, but I just want to know if there's any more data. The boosters are, are they waning? And is there anything that's suggesting we need a fourth booster? Um, there, there was a re recent report that um, the, uh, the four month mark was the time when immunity appears to fall significantly. Suzanne, I, do you remember if that was based on antibodies or if that was real world uh, development of COVID? I don't. In fact, I, I just walked, I, I think I just looked at the Coast article about it without going back to the original source. So another thing, Cynthia, is to look at is, uh, you know, it, we always have to ask, what is it we're asking? Or we're asking chance of infection. We know there was a lot of Omicron, breakthrough Omicron. Or are we asking symptomatic disease like ER visits? Or are we talking hospitalization, severe disease, and death? And, and the, the vaccines really um, are different in those different parameters. So it really depends what the question is. Um, but I don't remember. I know there was a, a waning of efficacy and I don't remember if that was based on actual people getting COVID, which is a more real world um, um, data, or it's based on um, antibody levels because antibody levels do not tell the whole story of immunity. Um, you know, antibody levels are something we can measure, but there's a whole other part of the immune system with T and B cells um, that have memory that probably are really working, particularly for those people who get really sick and for hospitalization and severe disease. That's probably what's happening. It's not just the antibodies. It's the T and B cell memory that's, that's going into effect. It may be less effective for simply um, getting COVID or, you know, maybe um, less effective for um, preventing uh, slight, mildly symptomatic disease. So I guess it depends on the question, but Suzanne, are you looking for that article? I'm, yeah, I'm looking for it. I'm not finding it off the top of my head. Yeah, I can look that up for next time. But I, yeah. guess I'm also wondering. But, but I do remember that it's the four month mark that they're mm -hmm. talking about, however they measured it. But I, I guess I'm asking the question for two reasons. Um, I know people who are getting a fourth. I can't hear you for some reason. I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I know people are getting a fourth boost on their own, and they're getting it. Yep. And I and I'm just not hearing anything about should we, should we not? Is it coming? You know, I, I'm just wondering. Well, I think people are getting the fourth shot because Israel is doing that. Uh huh. Right. Um, but there was an article out of Israel. Um, I, I have to go back and find it that even people who had the fourth shot, it did not significantly increase their antibody levels. Um, so the question is, we don't know yet if that fourth vaccine is really protective or not. Um, so, think, yeah. I think in the past 48 hours or so, Dr. Fauci was asked that question. He said the decision hasn't been made yet. Yeah, certainly not recommended by CDC at this time. Thanks. But I know I know people are doing it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's because CVS and Walgreens is not as compulsive as our Kate Kelly. Kate Kelly goes and checks everybody's immunization history before she gives them a shot, right? All right, any other questions for Vivian? Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Great, Thank you. great slides. Thanks, Bev. All right. Um, all right. Um, reviewing the mask order. Um, any thoughts? Uh, Meredith, do you have anything you want to say about that? Um, well, as we heard earlier, um, Desi lifted the mask order for the schools come February 28th. On 215, Governor Baker updated the advisory for face coverings, saying that fully vaccinated, um, fully vaccinated if you have a weakened immune system or are high risk for disease, you share, it's recommended that you wear a mask indoors. Um, if you're, if you're um, fully vaccinated and you don't fall in those groups, then it's not recommended by the state. So that was an update. The CDC is still um, saying that if you are in a community, a county that is, falls under high or substantial risk level for community transmission, then universal in, ma indoor masking is recommended. Um, so given that information, in addition to the information that Vivian provided us today, and if we wanted to look at that map again, we most certainly can, um, we're getting there. Um, we like to look at larger chunks of data set when we make decisions, you know, making a decision off one week's worth of data isn't recommended. It's not showing us a trend. It could just be a blip. Um, so I guess my recommendation is, well, the trajectory is good. Um, let's set a date. I, I don't agree with the February 28th date for a couple reasons. I want a good more couple weeks of being in the yellow going towards the green or the blue on the CDC map. Um, and also the school kids are coming back from school vacation on the 28th. So people might travel, there might be some more social events going on. So I'd like to have a little buffer zone after that date, um, just so you know, we can reduce any type of transmission happening um, in the schools. Because you gotta remember, um, they are not socially distanced in the school, they are three feet apart. So my recommendation to the board um, would be, yes, let's set a date because everybody is talking about this off ramp. The, the anti-maskers, the maskers, everybody kind of wants to know a date. Um, I think it's more digestible if we put that out there. And if I were to recommend one to you, I would say, given the information that I just provided to you, I would say, let's set the date of March 14th, but let's have a Board of Health meeting on March 10th, just to make sure that all is still going in the right direction. Um, you know, we also, we wanna look at local, state, national data. We wanna see if anything, other variants of concern pop up between now and then. If everything is all still good, then it just gets lifted on the 14th. That would be my recommendation. I also know um, Amherst, I talked to the health director in Amherst, she too is thinking on the same lines that I'm thinking, um, and I possibly Hadley also. So having contiguous communities kind of be in alignment um, makes sense too. Did I hear correctly that CDC is currently meeting on metrics? So yeah, the CDC is considering new benchmarks for masks based off level of severe disease and hospitalizations, but it's not been done yet. So we might see that coming in the next week or two. Um, I, I was gonna suggest that we wait until those metrics come out, which seems to coincide with your recommendation. Mm -hmm. Wait another three or four weeks. 
Um, let, let's see what happens when the kids get back from, from February break. Um, and I remember that we've been discussing for many months the fact that we would love to have metrics and not just be guessing depending on the shape of a curve. And it would be really nice to have metrics that had been vetted by experts, mm -hmm. at least as a reference point. Yeah. And we've been working on that, Suzanne. And actually, um, I don't know if I can, Viv, if you want to share your screen, this is just a rough draft. And this is just some thoughts that we've been putting together, right? Because expectations are hugely important. We learned the second time that we, um, do, do you know which, oh, sorry, Viv. Do you know which um, document I'm talking about? Okay. Um, the second time that we put the mask order in effect was a lot harder for people to digest the first time around. So I can't even imagine what that would be like for us to have to do it a third time. Um, so we were thinking of using, and, and we can use the same colors that the CDC uses, but what we were thinking was something a little more simple um, using like, we used to use this way back when, two years ago when COVID just came, like this um, stoplight symbol, meaning it when you're in the green, we have very low incident rate, very low positivity rate, and really very, li uh, very few limitations, like proceed as business as usual, you know, our new normal, let's say would be green. Then when you're in the yellow, we're at moderate transmission, and then we make recommendations as you can see underneath the yellow heading right there. But then we combined um, substantial and high transmission with those metrics under one being red. And if we were to hit that again, those metrics, then the mask mandate would be put into effect again. And we would recommend that you avoid indoor gatherings with non-household members. Um, avoid, you know, people who are at risk for severe disease, so on and so forth. So we were kind of um, really putting some thought into this. Is this a document that would hold up? It would. It certainly would have held up over the last two years through all the different variants that we've seen. I'm not sure it could hold up moving forward. A, because we're not sure about testing. Is testing still going to be around at the rate it is? I'm not sure. Another variant could just present differently, so it could just throw all this out the window. Again, um, I'm not sure, but we are thinking about this um, just so people know what to expect as we learn to live with COVID in an endemic way. Yeah, I love this uh, this idea of having metrics to use to to uh, to inform our policy. I think the testing piece is complicated. I think more and more people will use, be using home tests, and unfortunately, as the prevalence of disease in the community goes down, those tests are less and less accurate. Um, but um, and then they're not connected to our Department of Health at all. I mean, everyone's doing them at home. So I think that's a problem and I don't know how to solve that one. Um, but we do, um, we'll do testing, you know, for example, at the hospital, we have our own group of people that we test. So we test a mix of uh, asymptomatic people like before surgery, um, but also symptomatic people. So, I mean, we can see a trend there in our, uh, even without sort of a surveillance testing in the community. But. Can I ask a question again on this is that if, you, if I look at this criteria for transmission, what if your 14 day incidence rate is not consistent with this percent positivity rate? Because I was under the impression in the data that Vivian showed us earlier, the more recent number um, it had a fairly low positivity rate and a high case counts. So I think it was an or, it's not and, is that correct, Vivian? No, oh, it's or, okay. Yeah. Also in the, in the data that Vivian showed us, she showed us our local case counts, but the state 
percent positive. So they weren't exactly mm -hmm. the same data. So the way that it happened, uh, the trend that we saw, and it, it, this holds over time for the last two years, may not in the future, was we would see an increase in our positivity rate, then we'd see an increase in our case rate, and then we'd see the increase in the hospitalizations. I, I know a lot of people are recommending counting hospitalizations and deaths and really putting aside case counts when deciding metrics like this. Because isn't the future, that's right, isn't the future essentially people feeling sick and not, <laughs> and all of this going unreported and not tested? Right. Uh, it, I mean, there are, there are experts who, who recommend dropping the case counts um, because of the reasons Joanne outlined. If we could get data from the hospital that, um, that was hospitalization due to COVID, not just hospitalization where COVID was found. That could be very helpful. It's a much smaller number, but- so, least... Yeah, so the, um, the state is now collecting that data. We have to report that to the data, to the state, right. not only our COVID cases, but whether they're incidental <laughs> COVID or they're admitted for COVID. So the state was collecting that. Um, been collecting that for a few weeks, I think. Going, Maybe. For, going forward, Sorry. that could be a very important metric that we have much more solid data about than case counts. Maybe you back to your wastewater sampling. When we get the money for it. It's expensive. I mean, that would be great, but we don't have the funding at this point. Uh, hopefully the state will do that because that seems the most reliable um, metric. But the, the question is, if we if the um, variant that's circulating is doesn't cause severe disease, then it doesn't really matter so much. Um, and then and then on top of that, we have new oral treatments to try to keep people out of the hospital. Um, so it's a whole different way of thinking about about this disease. Um, but you know, we could have another variant that's very deadly. Um, we really don't know where we're going uh, at all. So. It, it's interesting. I agree with this, is that six months from now, this whole table may be so completely obsolete that we'll have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And then, and as it's, it's true. It's good to have a criterion to some, some sort of metrics and the decision based on the metrics, but it seems that the goalpost keeps moving. Well, would the circumstance of the disease keep, keep changing? Yeah, I sort of think of each variant as a sort of a new disease because it has such different characteristics from the one before. And um, yeah, but but um, Meredith, I think this is great. And I think this is something we can sort of bring back and see if it applies, if we have another, you know, need for it. We'll, we'll see how it fits. Um. Are we talking about the mask mandate as well as the, the metrics? Um, I think the messaging about a change in the mask mandate is very tricky because I, hear, I believe people will hear um, masks are no longer required and they will not hear the exceptions. And that's difficult to communicate because it's people 65 and older it's people who are not vaccinated. It's people who are immunosuppressed. And anyone who lives with someone in that group, that's a hard message to communicate. I also fear that lifting the mask order may give people a sense that we're out of the woods with COVID, which we're not. I really feel that there needs to be a solid communication plan that um, while we're in the period of moderate transmission, community transmission, that other public health measures really need to be thought of. And again, we're, we're listing them there. Um, everybody wants to get to their new normal and the masking is that, that first step. It's a giant step, um, but I just feel like it's, 
it's just going to be a free fall for many people and it might we might see an uptick because of it I, and i feel if we go back to the date i i just really question us putting a date out there at this point in time for those things that we've been saying that if we say okay we'll lift it on march 14th we're not lifting it on March 14th. We're lifting it on March 14th if A, B, C, D, E are, are met. And if as soon as we put a date out there, people are gonna hang on that date. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. And, and, and the flip-flopping is, is one of the criticisms of, of the entire healthcare system and guidance and hierarchy. And I just don't, see the need to put a date on it just yet. And, and just to have the, you know, the messaging is, is we're still exploring it because we don't know. I mean, we're so happy that we're at where we're at. But as we've witnessed for two years now, we just never know what's coming around the corner. And I, and I also wanted to ask, I heard on the radio that the school department in Northampton follows what we do. Is that true, Meredith, or? That's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to make that known. So whatever we say tonight or in the future, that's what the school department is going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the, school, the schools fall under our mask mandate. Okay. They that's can choose to mask longer than that if they wanted to. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's what you were saying. Yeah. I'm, com I'm comfortable just revisiting this at every every meeting and looking at the data as we have been and hopefully before our next meeting CDC will be out with their metrics and we'll have a much more solid foundation upon which to make a decision. I, mean, I get it. I'm real tired of it too. Everybody's tired of it and, and um, it it's, it's been very difficult and continues to be difficult. Um, but I don't think that, it, I don't think it's a good reason to lift the mask mandate just because people are tired of it and want to get back to normal. I, that's, that's an overarching theme, but that's not the basis for it, for the decision. Lauren? You want to uh, weigh in? Um, I have mixed feelings. I mean, I hear some very reasonable arguments. I'm, I'm hearing the, the 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 winter break as a as a determinant. Um, I also think that um, I, I I I'd be surprised if there's an uptake. That would be great. So it's um, it's basically making a prediction, and it looks like the state is making a prediction on February twenty eighth. So, do they know something, or is this a was this a, a a decision, political decision they're making? It's I'm surprised they choose February twenty eighth, uh, February twenty eighth, which is the the day the kids returns from winter break in Massachusetts. All right. Um, so that's. That's a little strange. Um, I, I, I do think that it's going to be, um, well, first of all, that date of March 16, uh, if, you know, this meeting being open to the public will be published tomorrow somewhere. <laughs> um, so this is going to come as a date, regardless of what we say tonight. Um, but I think once, once we enter the spring, it's going to be really hard. It's, it's, it's going to quickly, you know, because there's a state that's the state is saying February 28th and we're saying more in March, we're quickly going to find ourselves uh, a little bit isolated, I think. I don't think Boston has removed their mask mandate. No. So the largest city in the state has a stricter policy than the, than the governor. And actually, the state wasn't even, uh, it wasn't a mandate. It's been an advisory. Right. It's Desi that's saying, Desi, the Department of Education right. that's yeah. saying the 28th. The governor just uh, amended his advisory right. and pretty much lifted it. What, what makes me a little bit worried, uh, I would say, is that, you know, if, if, Mass, if, if the governor has put an advisory in place, it's going to quickly going to be 
may be more difficult for the business of Northampton to, to it, they, they might be some confrontation about it. It's what I suspect is gonna happen. So we putting them in a little bit in a, you know, difficult situation in the next in the next few weeks until we decide to lift this for good or lift it so you know I, I overall i have mixed feelings about being a little bit more you know being taking additional steps related to the states and i wish the cdc also said the same thing and again overall i think you know we're being prudent but i i again i have mixed feelings Um, so, um, how would you like to proceed? I'm actually going away for two weeks. So we have our regularly scheduled board of health meeting on the 17th. Um, I'm away on the third, but I could meet on the 10th. Wasn't it the date that uh, Meredith proposed the 10th? So I think that would work. Yes, would that and that's two weeks else? after the routine on two weeks after the return from uh, the, the the winter break. Right. So I think that'd be pretty clear indication whether or not we have an uptake or not. Cynthia and Suzanne, does the 10th work for you? The 10th works for me. Yes, it does. I like three weeks better than four weeks. Okay. Um, so does anyone want to make a motion? No one has to make a motion. Just this would be the time to make a motion if someone wanted to make a motion. To, to change the mask regulations? Whatever you want. Does someone want to make a motion or we're gonna move on to our next agenda item? Well, I think we need to be clear. Um, uh, I think we do need to be clear whether or not we're setting a date or um, maintaining our our mask um, restriction right now, don't we? Or, or do we just move on and then it's... <laughs> so if there's no motion, then we continue the mask mandate um, and there's okay. no particular date, um, unless someone wants to make a proposal of some specific kind. I, I, I guess the best I would do is to go along Meredith's line and saying we revisit on the 10th for potential lifting of the mask on the 14th. Um, I, I, I would, I, I think I would want to have a date in place um, to, to provide some reassurance that, you know, we, we gonna, we, we gonna definitely move on this. I might, what, what concerns me a little bit, again, you know, it's hard to predict the future, although I think the future is good based on what the trend that we're seeing. Um, but um, I, I, you know, having something in place will perhaps alleviate the frustration of the city of Northampton, the residents. But it also can cause confusion. And so, um, and maybe, um, give a false, you know, false date, a false notion if something else happens. So I'm very concerned about that. So right now, I think we've all agreed to meet on the 10th and that this mask mandate would be our on our agenda. The CDC process and recommendations would be very helpful, not only for lifting the mask mandate, but for re-instituting it should we need to. We, I, I hope you're right, Lauren, I really do. When is the CDC, what was your prediction of when the CDC is gonna speak? They said imminently. I heard from one person this week, but that's just a rumor. I read today, any day now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you have the same source I have. <laughs> anytime, very soon, in short order. <laughs> I think they do feel great pressure 
they've been under enormous pressure, but great pressure on this particular issue. Especially since the states are already moving. Democratic state for that matter. <laughs> no, even, even democratic states are. Right. Yeah. But the, you know, those decisions are not purely made by public health. They're so political. So it's hard to yeah. Yeah. tease out what's what. But it's helpful to have a scientific perspective to add to it. I just think we're not, um, I don't know, Lauren, yeah, I think you suggested that we would be avoiding something by not doing a date. And I don't think we're avoiding anything. I think we, to be consistent with this board, we have always looked at data and science and made decisions accordingly. I don't think we're um, avoiding making a decision by making this particular decision. So I just want to clarify that unless you think you know, we, there's that perception out there. Um, Once that date's out there, it's out there. Yeah. All right, any other discussion? So we'll meet again on the 10th. Um, all right. Um, new business, Meredith, uh, you already covered uh, sort of your thought about metrics. Uh, did you have anything else? No. I, I wanted to ask, uh, as part of my on, on work, I started to talk to someone who's, um, who's doing uh, air exchange measurements uh, in, in, in buildings, who has a device. And uh, I floated the possibility of him coming to present if he's interested to, to show us uh, some of these techniques. And I don't know if there's any interest from this board to have him come on the next meeting and, and, and give him 15, 20 minutes to talk a little bit about how they proceed to do those measurements. Can you explain once again what he does? He developed uh, an instrument that measure, uh, uh, typically when you wanna measure air exchange rate, um, you could inject a tracer uh, and then you measure the tracer and you let the tracer dissipate, right? Mm -hmm. And that tracer can be as simple as uh, um, um, dry ice, so you increase the carbon dioxide content and uh, you come, you can even do this in your bedroom, right? You in the morning, you put your CO2 detector and you see the number is gonna, is gonna drop uh, to the extent no one stays in that room. And you can, based on that, that, that curve, you can, um, you can back calculate the air exchange rate in a building or in a room. Um, so he's doing this using uh, certain certain particles that have the same size as, as COVID particle. And I forgot the exact term, whether they colloidal particles, I, I have to, to, to look at my notes again. But he's, he's worked on an instrument to, to, to do that. Um, and I, I was just curious whether there's any interest in him coming in and talking to us and maybe do a, you know, if we can convince him to do a demonstration in one building, see if we can see if we can get some data. A municipal building, for example. So I don't know. I'm just just offering this. Uh, if you want more specifics, I can I can email this to Meredith and and she could and or or, uh, or Kelly and it can be passed passed along to the rest of the board. But I just wanted to know that's something you'd be interested in. Is he selling his services for this, or is it something that businesses could do? Like, how would this be useful? I think the way you could imagine is having an instrument. So we'd have to figure out the cost of the instrument, owning an instrument as the, maybe the, the health department owns an instrument and can do measurements around buildings oh. as part of what we do. Now mm -hmm. I'd have to look at the type of price, price point he's looking at, that may be 1500 around that, that price for this type of instrument. Oh, he's selling the instrument. Yeah, but it's something he's been developing recently. And I think I was not necessarily, I, I was not necessarily looking at him selling us instrument as much as educate ourselves about what can be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I may, it, it, this may be just to, for us to have ideas. I'm not suggesting, he, he, you know, he's more, 
they, they more at a stage of doing R and D type instrumentation. So I don't know exactly what what he wants to do, but certainly you know, I, it, perhaps he is a way for us to identify the problems that we have as a city and maybe get you know he might get ideas of his own from a discussion we're having with him. Mm -hmm. Do you want to send that information to Meredith? Yes. That would be great. Um, Meredith also had an idea of a, um, a ventilation specialist who gave an in-service at the schools. Um, Meredith, do you have any more information about that? Are you still here? Of uh, maybe having that person come educate us um, about, you know, what they taught the schools and what, what they learned and what they could easily um, implement. Am I frozen? Now you're back. Okay. okay. I shut everything down because I was freezing on and off. Um, yeah, uh, I have the name and I haven't reached out to him yet, but I've also will be asking the school committee members if we can get the um, videos. He did like a four mm -hmm. series presentation for the schools and for the parents. So we can just kind of see what type of information he's offering and see if it's applicable to our businesses so we can view it before we, um, you know, ask him to come in and present if, if he can um, and pay, I'm sure, a consulting fee, so. That would be great. Um, and on the same subject of our businesses, uh, I think you guys all got the letter uh, that was just sent to the businesses, I think, just this past week. So we haven't heard back. Um, Great letter. Thank you. Uh, and with the best, that was with, went out with the best practices um, recommendations. Um, and so, um, 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 Amy uh, thought that the best next step would be to survey uh, like send out a questionnaire um, to the businesses about what they thought. Um, Amy, do you want to uh, talk about that? Is, is Amy a co-host? Can she? Yeah, there you go. Oh, you're, you're muted. I've been uh, going a little bit back and forth with Amy K. Lane and um, just giving, we got really no feedback from best practices. So we think that's a good thing. Like they're absorbing it and figuring out what they're doing, what they're not doing, what they have no intention of doing or want to do. Um, so the survey would be to more ask um, a little bit about vaccination, no vac vaccination mandate, but um, more about ventilation and what who has done it, who hasn't done it, um, what their challenges were, if they did do it, who they um, looked to for advice on how they did it, just to see what's out there, because we don't really know. Um, and I think one of the questions we added, it, it's not quite done yet, and I'll share it with you when it is. Uh, before it goes out and see what else we want to tweak to it. But um, would they actually be interested in um, hearing from someone like in a, in a training kind of venue? Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about forums and, and focus groups, but uh, maybe one step at a time, um, you know, just hearing that we're not hearing a lot from them, which is a great thing. I feel like I feel like they feel what we feel, like what you guys all said tonight is that they're trending, we're trending down and it's spring and um, we got a nice letter from the, the health department, you know, just reminding us again what to do. So uh, hopefully that's the direction. I think it would be very difficult to convene a significant number of bar and restaurant owners. They work long hours. And I think that'd be very, very difficult. If we could collect data in some other ways, such as a survey, I think that that would be helpful. And I, I like Warren's idea of perhaps we could provide a service, of me a measurement service that would give them um, tangible information about the situation in their restaurant, because then the education is targeted to their specific um, venue. Amy, are you ready to do uh, air exchange rate measurements in <laughs> restaurants? Um, you know what? Teach me anything. We can we can do just about anything. 
we want to yep. we yep. understand what they need. Um, you know, we want to have, we ha already have relationships with them. Um, so yeah, want to continue. So I, I found um, who they used. His name is Joseph, uh, Joseph Allen. He's a uh, faculty at Harvard, um, associate professor, director of Harvard Healthy Buildings Program, co-director of public health and business leadership, deputy, deputy director of Harvard Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health. So. Is he qualified? <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so if, uh, if, if we already have some videos that he's created for the schools, we'd, I think we'd love to see those. I think they're all right here. I'm, I'm on his webpage right now. I'll send this link out to you so you can guys, so you guys can look for yourself. But he's got a lot of information on here with some videos. That'd be great. So we can educate ourselves and then we'll be able to educate uh -huh. others. Mm -hmm. There ever were an opportunity to use some of the new funding um, for ventilation improvement, it would be nice to have baseline data to, to make those decisions upon. Yeah. Um, I just put it in the chat for you guys. Can you send it by email? I never understand when you put things in the chat, how we get to see them afterwards. Oh, certainly. <laughs> Thank you. You can even click on it. You can't? <laughs> yes, you can. You can click on it now, but if I didn't click on it now, I, it'll be lost, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to copy it. And then you save it to your favorites. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. I got you. <laughs> um, all right. Anything else under new business? Meredith, do you have anything else? Nope. Thank you, Amy. I look forward to our new member joining us. I look forward to putting a little COVID behind us and talking about all of the new and exciting initiatives that we are, we're thinking about in the health department and our different tracks. We've got a lot going on and we just want to start strategically planning and implement. And so there's a lot of good works going on besides COVID and besides COVID. So we're just looking forward to, uh, to spring and new topics for our agenda. A new member been selected by the mayor? I believe so. I, I, I'm not sure if council um, voted the new member in. I, they might have to go through two readings. I'm not sure um, I think so. where they're at with the process. Okay. Thanks. All right, that's, that's progress. Um, and then we still have to do minutes. Fantastic minutes. <laughs> nice and short. Those were amazing, Kelly. <laughs> um, Back uh, off, Laurent. <laughs> well, I had some, and I had some excellent news, which is I have read the minutes and I had no comments. <laughs> nice. Wow. Nice. And neither do I. <laughs> wow. All right, Cynthia. Nope. Any nope. comments? No awesome. comments. Wow. Would someone like to make a motion? Go ahead, Lauren. It's my great pleasure to <laughs> make a motion <laughs> to approve the minutes with as as uh, as posted. Well, as uh, as drafted. Second. <sighs> Any other discussion? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Yay. I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> Knock it out of the park, Kelly. Knock it out of the park. Yes, you I did, Kelly. To do it again. Great. <laughs> right. you'll, you'll sleep makes, well tonight. Makes it easier all around. Thank you so much. Um, anything else? So we will meet again on the 10th. The vaccine, um, sorry, the uh, mask mandate will be on our agenda as usual. Um, anything else? I'm good. I think we're good to go. Thank you all. Thank oh, you. Someone needs to make a motion, right? Oh, oh yes. Move motion. to close the move to uh, end the meeting. Second. 
Any other discussion? All in favor? Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne. Thank you all so much.